Hello, I am Dr. Rizal Kurzrock, the Linda T. and John Mellows Endowed Chair of Precision Oncology and a Professor of Medicine and Associate Director of Clinical Research at the MCW Cancer Center and the Linda T. and John Mellows uh, Center for Genomic Sciences and Precision Me Medicine uh, in Milwaukee. Uh, today, I am delighted to be joined by Dr. Luduma uh, Bashanova, a medical oncologist and professor of medicine specializing in lung cancer at the University of California San Diego Moore's Cancer Center in San Diego, and Dr. Ignacio Wistuba, pathologist and chair of the Department of Translational Molecular Pathology, with a joint appointment in the Department of Thoracic Head and Neck Medical Oncology, and co-director of the Khalifa Institute of Personalized Cancer Therapy at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Uh, so we are going to start with her two targeted tumor agnostic tumor agnostic therapies in solid tumors, uh, which is, as I mentioned, an evolving uh, landscape. So uh, although uh, tumor agnostic therapies are relatively new, we have now nine tumor agnostic indications in the solid tumor space. And that includes three drugs uh, for intract fusions, uh, Dibrafenib and Tremetinib, which is a combination of two drugs for BRAF V600E uh, mutation. Uh, Selpercatinib, which targets RET gene fusions. And two immunotherapies, Pembrolizumab for microsatellite unstable tumors and for tumor mutational burden high tumors, and Dostarlamab for uh, tumors that are deficient in mismatch repair. And our newest approval is for trastuzumab derux tcan which targets HER2 positive tumors, in particular with IHC3+. Uh, this most recent approval um, is for adult patients with unresectable or metastatic HER2 positive, as I mentioned, IHC3 plus solid tumors who have received prior systemic treatment and have no satisfactory alternative treatment options. Uh, this approval is based on uh, three destiny trials with impressive response rates between about 47% and about 53% of uh, patients. And uh, we will discuss uh, these, uh, this approval in more depth as we go along. Uh, there are also uh, multiple other trials of HER2-targeted tumor agnostic uh, therapies. And uh, these include uh, trials that have been completed, such as the MyPathway trial, which um, incorporated two antibodies, pertuzumab and trastuzumab, in the tumor agnostic setting. But um, the HER2-targeted tumor agnostic uh, therapies are, uh, there are also several in phase one and phase two trials, and they include small molecule inhibitors, antibodies, and antibody drug conjugates uh, as well. When we're targeting HER2 alterations in cancer, uh, there are several different types of HER2 alterations to be targeting. And uh, this includes HER2 gene mutations, which alter the structure of the receptor and lead to constitutive activation of HER2 without necessarily causing an increase in gene expression. But uh, targeting HER2 includes targeting HER2 gene amplifications, which are characterized by an increase in the number of HER2 genes and in the HER2 gene expression. And we can also target at the protein level, HER2 protein overexpression, which is generally demonstrated by looking at immunohistochemistry uh, for HER2. I wanna start um, by asking, um, what do the clinical trial data tell us about the use of trastuzumab deruxtecan for HER2 positive advanced solid tumors? This is an area that you're an expert in, Dr. Bashanova, and I was hoping that you could share your thoughts on this topic. 
Absolutely. Um, I think building um, from what you said a couple of slides ago, in order for us to discuss the use of trastuzumab deruxtecan for advanced solid tumors, we need to understand the differences in um, HER2 alterations. So trastuzumab deruxtecan is currently have, um, I would say, two categories of approval. One is that's been approved for quite some time now, using of trastuzumab deruxtecan for patients with lung cancer who harbor a mutation in exon 20 of HER2. Um, the trial used trastuzumab deruxtecan as a second line after failure of platinum doublet and had a very respectable response rate of about 55%. Responses were durable and progression-free survival was also very good. Recently, we saw an approval of the same drug, trastuzumab deruxtecan, for patients with HER2 or overexpressed solid tumors. And this is based on three separate clinical trials. Destiny pan tumor O2, which included um, tumors of endometrial, cervical, ovarian, bladder, biliary, and pancreas. And here they looked at efficacy of trastuzumab deruxtecan based on overexpression of HER2. They enrolled the patients who had HER2 2 plus and HER2 3 plus. And I think also very important to note is that they saw a difference in response rate and patients who had an IHC3 plus had a higher chance of response than patients who had an IHC2 plus. And for example, in endometrial cancer, overall response rate in patients with IHC uh, positive, three plus positive um, HER2 uh, was 84%, which I think is really excellent. The challenge here is that the incidence of IHC3 plus is modest um, in some cancers. For example, in the same endometrial cancer that I brought before, there is about 15% of the patients who were who would express um, IHC HER3. In my opinion, even though the incidence of expression of HER3 is relatively low, the response rate is so high that every patient uh, missed is one too many. And that I think underscores um, our necessity to make sure we're testing our patients for IHC3+. Another cancer I, I would like to highlight, for example, biliary tract cancers. Um, only 10% of patients with that cancer will have IHC3+, but the response rate there is 56. And biliary tract cancers are the cancers that are pretty difficult to manage. And then when we return back to Destiny Lung 01, um, remember in lung cancer, we already have an approval of trastuzumab deruxtecan in HER2 exon 20 insertions, but there are some patients who will not have a HER2 exon 20 insertion, but will have HER2 overexpression um, with 3 plus. And there the overall response rate was um, different. It was a very small number of patients. The overall response rate was 53% uh, with 5.4 mg per kg um, and 20% in 6.4 mg per kg. Um, and the incidence of HER3 positivity in lung cancer, if you exclude exon 20 insertions, is about uh, 3 to 10%. And then looking at colorectal cancer, there was a destiny colorectal CRCO2 also looked at the patients who had a HER2 uh, overexpression. And there they saw for the IHC3 plus overall response rate was 46.9 at 5.4 mix cohort and 29.4 in 6.4 mix cohort. So um, in summary, I think uh, this gives us an additional treatment option for patients uh, with solid tumors that have overexpression um, of HER2 defined as IHC3+. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Bashanova, for that uh, excellent explanation. And uh, as the next part of this, which is uh, very important, uh, Dr. Wastuba, what does the tumor agnostic approval of a HER2 targeting agent mean for HER2 testing in patients with advanced solid tumors? Thank you, Dr. Kuzbrock. And as uh, Dr. Vashanova indicated, uh, I'm going to focus mostly on the HER2 protein overexpression analysis. And this for uh, the field of surgical pathology is an opportunity and a challenge. The opportunity is that, uh, you know, HER2 immunostochemical overexpression is a common biomarker that we run in 
pathology labs for breast cancer, for gastric cancer for many years. And they're validated uh, methodology to run the test and to examine, you know, and, 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 and make a determination of the level of expression. And three plus, you, you know, is, is zero, one plus, two plus, three plus, and, and three plus means complete, uh, a strong, complete staining of the membrane of malignant cell or basolateral level of expression. So, and in a percentage of 10 or, or, or higher uh, percent of malignant cells. So it's, it's something that pathology know. The, uh, the challenge is that now it goes beyond uh, gastrointestinal tumor and breast cancer. And now we have to uh, bring other specialized pathologies and start doing this determination. Uh, when And this is more challenging when there are sub-specialized practices. So, but in my opinion, if this should be could be adopted easily through pathology labs, the technology, the methodology is validated. The assay is has been in practice for many years. It's just a matter of educate uh, a pathology from different um, sub specializations to uh, do the analysis that we have been doing mostly for gastric cancer for the last uh, uh, seven years. So. How could the availability of her further HER2 targeting agents impact clinical practice? Uh, Dr. Bashanova, do you um, want to address that question? Sure. So as an oncologist, every time I have an extra treatment option for my patient, I think it's a win because that gives me more possibility to extend the life um, of the patient. And we have um, several um, drugs which are in development um, right now um, that hopefully will be useful for us once approved um, in managing patients specifically for what my interest is, is her to mutated uh, non-small cell lung cancer, but also having um, a treatment option for her to overexpressed lung cancer would be important. I think we cannot stress enough the need for testing because the only way for us to be able to offer um, those medications to our patients is to make sure we test our patients. And unfortunately, in lung cancer specifically, which, which is my disease of expertise, the testing is um, far from 100%. Um, and what can we do as a community to improve the testing um, in a multidisciplinary approach, uh, working with our pathologists, that would be an important uh, thing to, uh, to solve. If I may, I, I would like to actually also make a comment from clinical practice from the pathology perspective. I think that based on the data that have been shown, uh, adopting HER2 immunotochemistry expression analysis as a test that must be done in all carcinomas, I think that that would be helpful because clinical trials, they focus in the most common carcinomas, but the rare tumors uh, of this type that actually could uh, uh, benefit, patient could benefit from this therapy, and probably were not included in the clinical trials. So I think what you're saying is that there should be a reflex test yes. for HER2 immunohistochemistry in every solid tumor. And I have to say that uh, I agree with that, absolutely. What about patients who've received multiple treatments for advanced cancer? Should they still be tested for HER2 overexpression? Yes, the challenge there is um, it, you have enough material actually from the original biopsies to um, perform additional tests. So that is a, it's a challenge that we face most of the time in non-small cell lung cancer because the extensive immunosochemical molecular testing that is done in the biopsy. So, and if, if not available, is this a, an indication for a re-biopsy and, and, and a particular tumor type? I would favor that. But I think that is criteria of the medical oncologist if they want to do a biopsy to uh, uh, test uh, the current tumor. Um, there are some evidence in, in other tumor types like breast cancer that sometimes you could be positive in a original in a diagnostic biopsy, and then the positivity could go away in a subsequent um, biopsy after treatment. But this is early times for a other solid tumors on, in this particular field, so we don't know the answer to those uh, questions yet. 
So our next topic is HER2 targeting therapies in non-small cell lung cancer. And we're going to talk about both current and future considerations. So when we look at uh, the objective response rate for trastuzumab derux tecan in a HER2 altered non-small cell lung cancer, uh, we have the Destiny Lung 01 and the Destiny Lung 02 trial. Um, in the Destiny Lung 01 trial, uh, what was looked at specifically, specifically was HER2 overexpression, IHC 2 plus or 3 plus, or activating HER2 mutations in non-small cell lung cancer, uh, which was unresectable or metastatic and was relapsed or refractory to standard treatment. And with HER2 mutations, at 6.4 milligram per kilogram every three weeks, the response rate was 50. 5%. Uh, with HER2 overexpression, the response rates ranged from 34% to 26%, with the lower doses of 5.4 milligram per kilogram actually having the higher response rate. In Destiny Lung 2 um, patients with activating HER2 mutations who had metastatic uh, uh, disease, uh, metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, and who had recurrence or progression after at least one prior therapy were examined. And in these HER2 mutated tumors, uh, the overall response rates uh, range from 50% for the 5.4 milligram per kilogram dose to 56% for the 6.4 milligram uh, per kilogram dose. Uh, there are also a range of investigational HER2-targeted therapies in non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, this includes uh, TDM1 with an objective response rate of 38%, uh, peritinib, with an, uh, which is a mo small molecule inhibitor in patients with HER2 mutation with an objective response rate of 19%, Bay2927088. Uh, in patients with advanced disease and HER2 mutation, that is relaxed or refractory to at least one systemic therapy, which with an objective response rate of 70%, and zongertinib with um, uh, HER2 mutation, uh, again, advanced disease with an uh, objective response rate of between 44% or 74%. Between 44% to 74%, uh, depending um, on the uh, study uh, that was done. Now, let's discuss some of the key questions uh, that often come up when we're talking about targeting HER2 in the treatment of non small cell lung cancer. Dr. Bashanova, uh, this is uh, your uh, specialty, and um, I'm hoping that you can tell us more about the data uh, in non-small cell lung cancer and how these data impact clinical practice. So I'm going to first discuss the HER2 mutations in lung cancer and efficacy of trastuzumab deruxtecan. Then I'll move um, in highlighting the HER2 3 plus and efficacy of trastuzumab deruxtecan. So both of the studies gives us enough confidence that uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan is effective in patients with HER2 mutated non-small cell lung cancer. And the interesting story behind those two trials is the first Destiny Lung 01 was uh, performed with 6.4 mix per kick dose. Um, the response rate was 55%, duration of response was 9.3 months, and then median PFS was 8.2 months, and median overall survival is 17.8 months. Unfortunately, when that study was presented, um, a high rate of interstitial lung disease was seen, and therefore FDA required um, a, a different trial to be performed. So where two different doses were compared, 5.4 mg per kg and 6.4 mg per kg, and that is destiny lung O2. So the, the, the endpoints of destiny lung O2 was to compare those two doses and see which one of them is gonna be appropriate for approval. Um, and the Destiny Lung O2 uh, showed that there is not much difference in the efficacy uh, measured by overall response rate, duration of response, 
PFS and OS between those two doses, but the incidence of interstitial lung disease was much lower in 5.4 mg per kick dose, and therefore 5.4 mg per kick dose was approved for HER2 mutant non-small cell lung cancer. The one important thing that um, we need to highlight is the CNS efficacy of trastuzumab deruxtecan. As you all very well know, uh, brain metastases are common in lung cancer. This is one of the uh, most likely sites uh, to be involved, especially as the patients survive um, lung cancer with more months of life. And initially, when we looked at antibody drug conjugates, we always were thinking, you know, those are big molecules. What if they're not going to get in, this, in the CNS? And um, to our, I think, delight and surprise, uh, we see that uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan does have efficacy in CNS. So in my patient who have a small asymptomatic brain metastasis, I'm very comfortable just giving trastuzumab deruxtecan if they have a HER2 mutation and then watching that patient very carefully. Um, the overexpressing cohort is important. Um, the one thing that we have to highlight is that in the Destiny Lung 01, uh, the overexpressing cohort, patients with lung cancer and HER2 mutation were excluded from the overexpressing cohort. So if you have a mutation, you cite to the patient the Destiny Lung 01 and Destiny Lung 02 mutation cohort. If you don't have a mutation, then the data to present to the patient is the uh, Destiny Lung 02 overexpressing cohort, which as we highlighted before, um, had an overall response rate of about 26 to 34%. The PFS was, you know, expectedly, I would say, lower than the PFS and the mutating cohort as 5.7 um, to 6.7 month. And interestingly enough, and I think, um, as I mentioned, highlighted before, we also saw intracranial um, responses um, in the Destiny Lung 01 trial. Thank you for those important points and uh, the impressive data, especially uh, regarding brain metastasis. Um, what are the latest data for investigational HER2 targeted agents in non small cell lung cancer? And how do these agents potentially impact clinical practice? Yes. Um, so, the, what I'm most excited right now is tyrosine kinase inhibitors um, in HER2 mutated non small cell lung cancer. As I highlighted before, the trastuzumab deruxtecan is a good drug, but it is not a cure. And PFS um, is, is certainly not uh, 34 months. It's um, about 10 months. So eventually those uh, patients will um, progress and will need a change in therapy. And tyrosine kinase inhibitor being a different mechanism of action is very welcomed in that setting. Um, and so far we have data for three tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, number one is pyrotinib where overall response rate, in my opinion, was a little bit underwhelming at about 19.2%, uh, PFS about 5.6 months. And the two compounds I'm most excited about is uh, Bay compound. It doesn't have a name yet. It's a uh, Bay 2927088, uh, which looked at efficacy in patients who have non-small cell lung cancer and have a HER2 activating mutation. Um, who have progressed um, after one systemic therapy, but they had to be a HER2 targeted therapy naive. So um, patients who were exposed to trastuzumab deruxtecan would have been excluded from the study. But nevertheless, the overall response rate in a tyrosine kinase inhibitor um, in, in this Bay compound was 70, and median PFS was 8.1 months. And then another drug which um, we've been watching is Zangertnip uh, from the trial called Bimion Lung 01. And that looked at a patient's, um, initially for the phase one is just all comers, uh, but for the phase 1B, uh, the numbers, the response rate are actually quite um, important. Overall response rate of uh, 74%. And we do not have a median uh, PFS um, yet reported for the cohort 1B specifically, but I think I'm very excited um, in um, potentially seeing an approval of HER2 thyroxine kinase inhibitors uh, for patients with lung cancer who have metastatic disease and have activating HER2 mutation. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think your points about the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, having these additional molecules are very important. 
Um, what are the key safety considerations with these HER2 targeted agents and um, how can we support optimal outcomes for patients? Thank you. So a um, couple of important points in the um, adverse event profile um, in antibody drug conjugates and tyrosine kinase inhibitors. They are expected to be different because the drug has a different mechanism of action. Um, we as an oncology community are very comfortable with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. We have a lot of at least let me rephrase, lung cancer oncology community is very comfortable with tyrosine kinase inhibitors because we have um, TKIs approved for EGFR, ALK, ROS, NTRAC, RET. And so we actually know how to manage those side effects. Um, and majority of the side effects we see with the tyrosine kinase inhibitors is GI side effects such as diarrhea, mucositis. Uh, sometimes we see elevated ALT and AST. And as a community, we know what to do. So I think um, the side effects of tyrosine kinase inhibitors are not going to worry me in the level um, of um, incidence of adverse events that they're currently describing. The ADC was a completely different story to us because trastuzumab dirapstican was the first ADC that was approved in lung cancer. And so we um, are still learning how to manage a side effect of um, those compounds. And I think what was um, concerning to us when originally trastuzumab deruxtecan was used in lung cancer is the incidence of institutional lung disease, which was pretty high in uh, Destiny Lung 01 trial. And uh, taking into account the fact that we are dealing with the lung cancer patients who already have compromise of the uh, lung capacity from the tumors in the lung, having additional risk um, is um, has to be taken in very seriously. Um, one most important thing I um, teach to my patients as well as uh, my nurses and um, other people who work with me in, in patients is to have a high index of suspicions. Dr. Bashanova, thank you. Um, there are a variety of different HER2 alterations. Uh, that can occur in patients with cancer and in patients with lung cancer. Uh, Dr. Wistuba, can you uh, address how does the type of HER2 alteration or the her type of HER2 mutation impact the outcomes uh, with trastuzumab deruxtecan? Yes, in the context of, thank you for the question, in the context of patients with non-small cell lung cancer, I think the most important is a mutation of the gene and these mutations are relatively unfrequent, 2 to 4%, happen mostly in adenocarcinoma histology. And the most frequent mutation happening in this gene is in exon 20, that encompasses over 90%. And this is one of the exons that code the tyrosine kinase domain. But we have to keep in mind that all, also exon 18, uh, 19, and 20 uh, called for that uh, particular uh, domain. So other mutations may happen in the gene uh, uh, besides exon 20. So we need to be um, uh, open to that uh, information because some clinical trials focus on exon 20 mut uh, mutation of her 2 new because are the most frequent. So you can enroll patients on it. But also we need to keep in mind that some others affecting the tyrosine kinase domain, exon 18, 19, and 20, that could benefit from this therapy. There are some other mutations affecting the extracellular domain, the um, transmembrane uh, 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 part of the gene. And I personally don't have information how effective this therapy would be in those very rare mutations in the, in the HER2 gene. Thank you uh, for summarizing what is uh, very uh, important and complex topic. So the next topic, which is critically important, is determining HER2 status in non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, in order to treat patients, we have to have good quality control and standardized testing pro protocols for determining HER2 status. Um, so 
Uh, there are several de techniques for detecting HER2 alterations. Uh, mutations can be detected for but a wide variety of techniques, but I think uh, there is a consensus that next generation sequencing or NGS is the preferred technique. Um, amplification can also be detected by a variety of techniques, uh, FISH, NGS, uh, PCR. Uh, probably, again, NGS is a preferred uh, technology. And overexpression at the protein level is detected by immunohistochemistry. So now let's discuss some of the uh, key questions what, that come up when uh, we talk about looking at HER2 alterations, especially in patients with uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so uh, Dr. Wastuba, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what tests for HER2 alterations should be performed in these patients? and which methodologies should be used, and what are their pros and cons? So for uh, mutations, the most um, important test is next-generational sequencing that we need to make sure that include HER2 gene. And, and also the sequencing cover the four exons coding the um, a tyrosine kinase domain that produces activated mutations that can be treated with the therapy that we have been talking about, including exon 20. So that is a technique that's available, include the other important genes that we need to treat patients with a non-small cell lung cancer. And, and, and I think that is getting adopted. We have challenges on doing that, and we can discuss uh, those challenges. But I think that NGS is the way to make the proper um, assessment of these mutations. In terms of the proteins, as you have said, immunohistochemistry is the test. We have a validated test that has been developed for breast cancer and gastric cancer, and the 2 plus, plus and 3 plus um, uh, uh, determination can be used done using the gastric cancer uh, guidelines that have been um, uh, published by the College of America of Pathology uh, many years ago. So I think that that's summarized the status of testing for lung cancer. Uh, so I have a couple of questions that I think are important to address in addition uh, to what you covered, which is critical. Um, what about tissue versus blood NGS testing? Do you have a comment on that? I think that the uh, thoracic uh, malignancy uh, community have got consensus that tissue or cell-based test, if you use cytology specimen for cell analysis, uh, is uh, preferred, is what we should do in our patient because even in best, uh, in, with the best assays, uh, testing directly uh, a tumor, uh, malignant tumor cells have higher sensitive that uh, DNA coming from the tumor that is diluted in the blood in the in the in the liquid biopsy approach. So you have tissue available, that's the preferred test. If you don't have Liquid vibes is a very feasible approach to you find an abnormality like HER2 mutation or any other important gene in lung cancer in the liquid biopsy is positive. You, you treat it as a positive test, but if it's negative, you may need to actually uh, push for the analysis of the um, tissue in the form of biopsy or cytology because there is a sensitivity difference between both approaches, but both when are positive, are positive. Liquid when it's negative, mm, you may have a percentage of cases that you're missing uh, uh, and, and you need to uh, pursue tissue. But whatever you do, you do it in parallel. If you want to test both, that actually is very common practice using liquid and tissue or cell as a sample, you do it in parallel. Try not to do sequential uh, analysis because they waste time. Is there any practical differences between tissue and blood NGS testing time-wise for the treatment of the patient? Absolutely. So um, as uh, Dr. Vistuba just um, explained to us, um, there is a false negative rate to the liquid biopsy. So 
um, if you decide to just rely on a liquid biopsy, you're going to miss a lot of patients with oncogenic drivers that could benefit from treatment. Um, very important point to make is that in lung cancer, in metastatic lung cancer, <clears throat> recommendations are to wait prior to treatment initiation before um, to uh, for you to know what, what oncogenic drivers your patient have. So one of the practical reasons why, and I completely agree with Dr. Vestuba, doing it uh, concurrently is important because if you do it sequentially, you do the liquid, the turnaround time is about seven to 10 days. If the liquid is negative, you do the tissue, that's another three weeks. So it's a four and a half weeks. And technically you should not be initiating therapy, which psychologically is difficult for our patients. I um, do a concurrent a liquid and tissue. And if I send a liquid of tissue at the same time, liquid comes back in seven days. If there is a mutation on a liquid, I just start therapy because if it's in a liquid, it's in a tissue. Um, but if the liquid is negative, I already have tissue cooking. And then by the time the tissue comes back, then I know what to do. The one important thing I also want to amplify uh, what Dr. Vestuba said is um, Rebiopsy. Um, if I have a patient who, let's say, have a stage four lung cancer, especially if this is a patient um, have a very low smoking history, which has a higher incidence of mutations, and if your tissue is QNS, meaning wasn't enough to do molecular testing, highly, highly important to make sure you rebiopsy the patient. Um, before you do that. Another thing I want to point, I want to make our decisions to do molecular testing in lung cancer do not. Um, take into account race, gender, um, or smoking history. We are testing everybody regardless of any other characteristics. Uh, those are very important points. And I have one um, additional question for Dr. Wustuba, and that is what about the role of reflex testing? Um, and uh, what, do you, what do you think uh, regarding that? I, I, I favor reflex testing. I'm a big fan of it. Uh, and I think that for non-small cell lung cancer, uh, this should be a must. But also we need to acknowledge that is some institutions have challenges to implement this. And we don't need to go in that discussion. So it's not always available, and unfortunately, because when you have reflex testing and you uh, clinicians agree with the pathology department, on what is the test going to be done, immunostochemistry, as we discussed today, or and uh, next generation of sequencing, those are done in all patients with non-small cell lung cancer uh, on, 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 on the right um, uh, time frame, so we don't delay treatment. But there are some challenges, and I'm happy to discuss those if we have time. Uh, so uh, you think reflex testing for NGS and non-small cell lung cancer. I presume you think that IHC should also be reflex testing. Yes. Uh, please confirm. And do you think um, that IHC should be reflex testing for all solid tumors since there's an approval? Yes. And I mentioned that before. I think that based on the data that we have discussed today, her to her two immunostochemistry expressions should be reflex testing for all solid tumors. You have therapy available now that is effective for the patient. That includes uh, non-small cell lung cancer. I know that there is discrepancy between three plus or two or three plus, but that shouldn't matter to a pathology department because you just report the result of your test and based on the clinical data, the oncologist make the decision. And in terms of, um, uh, and we do that with PDL1 these days, right? So HER2 immunostochemistry should, should be added to the PDL1 reflect testing where in the places that is available. And of course, NGS for non small cell lung cancer should be um, uh, reflect uh, with the right panel and in all um, uh, biopsy and cytology specimens. Um, so I uh, completely agree with that, and um, I think it's critically important that reflex testing be instituted for um, definitely all patients with non-small cell lung cancer and uh, for IHC for all solid cancer patients because we don't want patients uh, to lose the opportunity to get an effective therapy. Um, is there... Uh, Dr. Wastuba, something 
uh, that we should particularly do to standardize and ensure quality control um, in our testing? Um, on NGS, I'm not particularly concerned about uh, the quality of the material. I think that's always important that for cytology and tissue specimen, pathology assess the best material available. So we provide the sample with the highest content of malignant cells. I think that liquid biopsy is a procedure that have a good um, methodology in place. So the material, the analytes, it will preserve even during transportation be uh, before the testing is done. And uh, regarding immunostochemistry, particularly we heard too, I think that extensive uh, information coming from the breast cancer community that indicates that for uh, a best um, uh, result in this particular test, the tissue should be fixed for a maximum of 72 to 96 hours because overfixation actually damaged the expression of the immunostochemical expression for her to her to uh, protein. Uh, but pathology laboratories have been working on this with breast cancer and gastric cancer for many years. So I'm, I'm not concerned, but it's important to emphasize this important pre analytical uh, issue for uh, immunostochemistry. Uh, Ludmilla and uh, Ignacio, thank you so much for this uh, interesting and critically important discussion on her too. And thank you for watching. We hope that you have found uh, this discussion informative and useful.